I will take you through what we call at Autodex the future of making things, and it does keep changing. So if you have seen this uh, presentation before, it's probably quite different from what you've seen last year. Um, I'm not going to keep you long. I've probably got about five minutes because the next presentation is much more exciting than mine. Um, so um, I'd like to start by looking into some global trends that we have um, researched over the last 12 months or so, especially in the construction industry. Um, our biggest challenge as, as a, a global challenge, I guess, is the population growth. By the year 2050, it is estimated that our population is going to exceed 9 billion. 2.5 billion of those people will be living in cities. To accommodate this expansion, we need to build 1,000 buildings per day. 1,000 per day. $3.3 million, trillion dollars need to be spent uh, on upgrading, maintaining, and improving our infrastructure, and we're far behind that. Um, let's not go far. If we look at our uh, local statistics, Infrastructure Australia um, has estimated that by 2031, so that's only 14 years from now, so it's definitely in, in, in my lifetime and yours, hopefully, um, we're going to be increasing our population by 7 million to accommodate those extra 7 million people in Australia. We're going to need 700,000 dwellings. And our biggest congestion uh, is going to, uh, sorry, congestion will quadruple. And that will be primarily from the infrastructure. Uh, inadequate maintenance to our major assets will become our biggest risk moving forward. So we all seen how South Australia suffered blackouts recently. Uh, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. And even in Victoria now, we're talking about blackouts this summer, depending on how much power we have. So certainly we have some big challenges. So how do we cope with those challenges in an industry where, where low margins are low, risks are high, and it's a very fragmented analog uh, industry? Um, a recent study showed that in the construction industry, there's only 1.7%, sorry, 1.2% is invested in digitization and IT of construction. Compared, if you look at the top end of the scale, manufacturing spent 3.3, so three times as much is spent in, in manufacturing compared to construction. But the good news is, construction is actually not the last on the list. So we've beaten agriculture and hunting. They actually spend less than construction. Anyway, so moving forward, uh, one of the reports also that we compiled estimated that there is at least $1.2 trillion per year of savings that the construction industry can gain if it goes through the digitization correctly. So let's have a look at some technology trends. Um, first one is high definition surveying. Now obviously pretty much everyone in the room would, would have maybe used or come across um, uh, laser scans these days and we know that one of the biggest challenges we have and one of the main reasons for project delays are either inaccurate or slow surveys. But these days we have high de definition surveys and laser scan that can help us with that. Machine learning is something also new that we haven't really adopted in any of the industries. It's probably um, adopted a little bit more these days in the architecture and the design uh, phases more than the construction. It's some kind of, you know, if I put it simply, it's let the computer decide on the ultimate outcome as long as we just keep the parameters in place. So when you think about something, we start this building by our own ideas already. We know what we want to achieve, and then we end up just using the computer to sort of materialize what we want to end up with. Machine learning is the other way around. You only just put the parameters and the requirement and let the computer come up with infinite um, uh, opportunities or, or, or options that we, as human minds, wouldn't even think about. Um, yesterday, during the panel, uh, Doug and someone else, and you know, pretty much every member of the panel, were focused on the industrialization of the construction. We're seeing more prefabrication uh, and robotics coming into the, the pre-construction phases, and that is something that also we're seeing uh, a lot more of at Autodesk, and we're trying to be part of that transition. Um, digital collaboration, for sure, AR and VR, and uh, Jared will 
will show us this lovely piece of technology afterwards. Um, so we can actually see what the asset is going to look like. We can probably get a very good idea on how it's going to perform without even a single brick being laid. So quicker, more efficient construction uh, through digital collaboration. Everyone here has heard of Internet of Things. It, it means a lot of things, but for us it means sensors are cheap and we can monitor every part of every asset and actually take uh, proactive measures. I went to the dentist a couple of weeks ago and you know he's a bit of a techie junkie, so he's really <laughs> happy that his um, chair is completely internet enabled. So before it actually breaks down, it sends whatever the error is to the manufacturer and you know, next morning the guy turns up with the part and he fixes it for him. So I said, I can make more money because I, you know, the chair never breaks down now. So you know, anyway, so the, uh, as I said, IoT means something different for everyone, um, but certainly it's got a lot of usage in the construction industry. So this is what we call the era of connection. If you look how over the last 20, 30 years we got here, we started by the, what we call the era of documentation, basically digitizing the 2D drawing, so we moved away from the drawing boards to AutoCAD or the PCs back then, 286s and 386s. And then we went to the era of optimization, which is the BIM era 10 years ago or so. Now we're in the era of, of con, uh, connection or what we call connected BIM. So simply connected BIM is BIM in the cloud. So we have the power of cloud, we have the power of all those um, uh, uh, technology trends, we just need to really adopt it a little bit more. So this is what we call future of making things. With this, I would like to present um, Jared Bassan to the stage, and Jared will take us through his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raf. So, um, there's a few things that we're going to cover off today, and I'm going to try and make this uh, uh, fairly exciting as well, I hope. And as you turn up with a smart helmet, it can't be anything that exciting. But um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I uh, just wanted to start with is there's obviously a few things about the... And I'm really glad we're Raph finished off, right? This is the era of, const uh, the era of construction and digital collaboration. And digital is really all about making... Uh, changes, digital transformation changes the way everything works. And one of the things that we really want to change is the way that people work. Okay? And we can enable people with technology and so on. But I'm going to, if we look, want to look forward, we also have to look back. So I'm going to start with something that happened a hundred, more than 100 years ago and, and go back to these two gentlemen who were really looking at how they could change the capability of a human and take a human and make a human fly. Now, 100 years ago, this was a radical idea. Um, however, they achieved it and they had a lot of failures along the way and they had to deal with how do you go through failures to get to success and they did that. But what they did is they changed the capabilities of humans. And this is a phenomenal achievement um, and we're still working through all the ramifications of that today, but it was a change. Right? And any change requires um, a lot of experimentation and failure along the way to get to that change, but we have to be brave to make that, to make that step. Um, now, when we talk about augmenting humans, um, just quickly, who's... Who's watched the film Iron Man? Tony Stark flying through the air, okay. All right, so just imagine if we could turn our, um, our workforce into people with superhuman capabilities that could do all kinds of amazing things and not make mistakes while they do it, right? What would, does, what would that mean to our industry? Right? And that's really what we're gonna sort of talk about today. So taking the capability of the human, just like the Wright brothers did and being able to make them to fly, we wanna be able to take the capability of our workforce and change it into something that is far and beyond what they're able and capable of, of doing today. Um, now, I'm from a company called DXC, a, a little, little hardly known company called DXC. It's probably the biggest company you've never heard of. Um, and we are the digital transformation company. We help companies, our clients, make digital transformation happen. And we do this across all sorts of industry sectors. And, uh, the, um, we have this heritage has come from two very large companies, Computer Sciences Corporation and, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, Solutions. And we have now completely changed what we do, so we are completely focused on digital transformation. And the reason why I say that is because digital transformation is 
something that is hitting the construction industry. And really what it is doing is this is all about changing the way people work. So we've got introduction of BIM and all sorts of other things, but it is changing what happens. And this is an unavoidable change, and it's hit all sorts of other industries, and they have been disrupted by these changes. And the various stages of the disruption, so whether it be banking and finance, or whether it be healthcare, or whether it be insurance, or manufacturing, um, the transformation has different names. Some, in manufacturing, they call it Industry 4.0. Um, they call it e-health in, in, in healthcare. Um, digital oil fields, if you're in the, if you're in the um, oil and gas industry. But these are all versions of digital transformation, and they've been hitting, hitting these industries. And construction is probably one of the industries that hasn't yet been hit as hard, anywhere near as hard. But what we do know is that it is unavoidable. We do know that the, all this digital technology culminates in massive changes to industries. And you are on the verge of going, undergoing that kind of change. So we wanted to talk to, you, to talk to you about some of the things that are going to help you through that, through that change process. It's not going to make the change any easier. There's going to be winners and losers, and there's going to be lots of disruption as a result of that. But what comes out at the end of it is, is, a, is, a, is an industry that does things differently. And we're going to show you some things that, that help along that path. And particularly around the nature of work, what we recognise, and this isn't unique to construction, this also happens in other places as well, but the very nature of work is changing up. We're dealing with uh, millennials who have grown up, and you call them millennials or, or the digital generation, whatever you want to label you want to give them, they've grown up on Facebook and Twitter and playing computer games in their bedrooms, and that's what they're used to, used to this digital world. They, they understand this, this is where they, what they grew up with. Um, and we need to sort of cater for that different change in thinking in the workforce as well. Um, the other thing that's happening, of course, is all our information has gone digital as well. So all the back-end systems that we use to design things, and Braff is just showing that off, all those systems have sort of progressed and it has been digitised and moved into the cloud. But the problem is, in construction, we get onto a site, and where does all the information live? Well, it's in the construction manager's office, and it's all printed as, as A0 plans, and they're marked up with pens and, and highlighter markers. And we've somewhere along the point, we've gone from having the beautiful 5D BIM model to a sheet of paper that's been scribbled on, and we've broken down that digital, that digital model. So what we need to understand is that we need to get the, the person in the field who's doing the work connected in to the digital models. And this is uh, 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 not unique to, again, not unique to construction by any means, but we're going to show you some technology that does that and, and helps along that way. And augmented reality is the, probably the technology that is, is uh, on the verge of changing many, many, many things. But in construction, what does it mean? It, it changes the way we interact with the physical world and the digital world. It puts the two together. All right? So we're going to have a building, we're going to have a BIM model. The moment we have a building, we have drawings and they're kind of disconnected from the BIM model. But what we can do is we can put them together. Uh, we can walk through the building with the BIM model, and we'll show you this actually working, um, and a few may have already tried this on the, on the, on the, on the helmet. But this is, a, this is actually happening right now today. This is reality, this, this does happen. Um, augmented reality is a technology. What it does fundamentally is it lets me put digital information and overlays it with a physical world. What does that mean? I mean, I could put text, I could put photographs, I could put video, I could put holograms, I could put three-dimensional holograms, and they sit there in the world in front of me, uh, almost as if they're real and they're connected. So that's great. But how do we know that this is really going to take off? Well, we just need to understand the amount of money that is being thrown into this technology from the likes of Apple and Google and Microsoft. They are investing huge sums of money in augmented reality technology. So actually the world's largest funded startup is a little company called Magic Leap. Again, no one's probably heard of, or well, few will have heard of Magic Leap. But um, they, they have raised more startup funding than any other company in the history of, of startups um, to the tune of, of $1.8 billion of startup funding. That's an enormous amount of money. They're just a startup. They haven't sold a single thing. They don't even have a product to sell yet. And they've raised that much, that much money. So this is the kind of money. And a lot of that money, by the way, came from Google and Alibaba.com. So these are the companies that are investing, as well as some investment banks and some of the movie studios. So these are the companies that are investing and pouring that money in. This is that's some of the, the sort of scale of money that's getting splashed around in the space. Very quickly, augmented reality, is it... It sounds like virtual reality almost. Is it the same thing? No, not quite. So the difference is, and the thing you need to understand, is with virtual reality, I put virtual reality on and I'm completely disconnected. I couldn't possibly contemplate walking across this stage and through that door with virtual reality on. I would fall over and I would hurt myself. 
I would trip. There's hazards in between. I, I can't see what's going on around me. With augmented reality, it's a very different. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate that. So I'm, I'm going to ask Raf. Can I'll just ask Raf back to stage? <laughs> <laughs> now, what we're going to ask Raf to do, we've got an augmented reality helmet here. I'll just ask you to put that on for a moment. Now, the first question, really important question, and if this was augmented, if this was virtual reality, you couldn't do this, but Raf, can you walk over here towards me? Okay. <laughs> can you see me? So what we're going to do, we're going to do a little, we're going to actually show, show this in action now. So I'm actually going to make a call to Raf. Right? We're going to use augmented reality and we're going to make a call. So Raf, um, I'm going to ask you first to make sure that you're in the remote expert application, that you can see that application. Now the scenario we've got here is Raf might be on a building site and I might be an architect in an office. Raf has got a problem. He wants to show me the problem. Now are you, are you ready from your end, Raf? No. All right. So you're going to make a call. Now, the call's going through to Raf, and he's going to answer it in a second. Hopefully, the feedback won't be too bad. Fantastic. So we're actually seeing exactly what Raf can see. So if Raf has a look over there, it scans around the room. You can see everything, and, and uh, I can, as, as the architect in the office, I can see everything that's, uh, that's going on. Now, we can do some, some basic collaboration. Now, this, by the way, is just running, this is live, of course, and this is all running through, at the moment, through a 4G connection on a phone. So uh, it's not running as, uh, perhaps, as, as smoothly as it sometimes does. But I can annotate on the screen, so Raf can see my, what I've just, uh, just indicated to him. So if if you know, he's on a site and he needs to know where to, where, to, where to cut or something like that, I can show him that, right? So this is a, a really simple, uh, and of course there's voice communication. We've turned the sound down so we don't get the, uh, we don't get the, the feedback. But uh, you know, we, can, we can talk between each other just like on a, on a Skype type call. So really simple example. Um, I can do some other things like I can share my screen with Raf as well. So Raf, um, I'm just going to show you the plans because uh, I know this never happens, but just imagine you'd, you'd forgotten your plans on site. So we can, uh, we can as an example, we can bring up some, uh, some drawings and Raf will be able to see what I'm showing on the screen. So um, what can you see there, Raf? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. <laughs> oh, we've dropped the call, OK. So um, the hazards of doing a, the hazards of doing a, a call on the, uh, on the a live demonstration. So we'll just go back to the to the to the presentation at this point. So thank you very much, Raf. So where do we use this kind of thing? So really, what this is about is making more effective utilization of people. Um, so how can we? reduce the amount of time that they spend traveling. So we don't have to get the architect to travel out to the site and lose an hour in between while, uh, while the site stops, while they wait for the architect to make a decision because you can't get to the site quick enough, right? So we can improve coordination, collaboration. We can make decisions faster. We can get better decisions made. People don't make the wrong decision because they don't have enough information. They can't see the problem. We can reduce delay and disruption. On the rework side, right, we can use these kinds of things to prevent mistakes being made, or at least significantly reduce the probability that mistakes get made. We can show what the building site should look like, or what today's job should look like, where I should be installing stuff before I actually go and do the installation. So now I know what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm much less likely to make a mistake. I can have the set out put on there and overlay it on the site so I can see what that is. And I'll show you this later on in a short video so you get the idea. Um, and then, of course, there's a significant uh, impact to safety. So there's a lot of things we can do here on safety as well. So even simple things like inspections and checklists and audits and things like this, we can actually capture in real time the inspection. We can have it videoed as well. Now, the key thing about the video ability to video it is that we're actually ca creating an auditable record that the inspection checklist was being filled out. So we're videoing what's happening around. The uh, worker is completing the checklist through auto, auto um, a spoken command, so hands-free. 
and we're also capturing the information at the same time. And the worker knows that they can be captured, uh, that the video is there. It's, you may not watch the video all the time, but it nonetheless is an auditable record. And the key thing about that is that's starting to drive the behaviour of the workforce too now. So um, how many check sheets come back from a building site and we know that they weren't actually filled in um, at, uh, out, out in the, on the site, they were filled in in, in, in an office off to the side because the sheet comes back clean. It's a clean piece of paper. It's got you know, the ticks and so on, but there's no, there's no mud or grease or, or, or anything on there. So we know, that the, we know that someone got filled it in later after the fact and put the signature on the bottom, right? It kind of defeats the purpose of having a checklist. If we create the auditable record, we know that we're getting that through. So in terms of use cases, inspections, being able to do inspections is a huge thing. Um, location and biometrics, you know, all the technology in there, we know where the person is as well. We can also start doing some biometrics, really simple stuff. One of the things um, we're doing at uh, Qatar 2020 um, site uh, is to start monitoring with some wearables, start monitoring what, um, what the, the dehydration levels are on the workforce and, and what the skin temperatures are, which is an elite indicator of the dehydration, to so keep the, the workforce uh, safe. They had some fatalities which triggered this, um, unfortunately. But that's what they're starting to do now. Um, in mine site in southern, uh, South, South America, uh, we've been working with a company, uh, one of the mining companies, who's, who's got an issue with the, um, the workers who are driving the trucks from the mine down to a port, and they drive through the Andes on the side of very steep, very steep uh, cliffs, and the drivers, it's a multi, many hour drive, the drivers are getting fatigued, and they, again, they, they've had some serious accidents with drivers have, have fallen asleep at the wheel. Um, and again, they're using EEG. So ECG is, is heart monitor, EEG brain monitor. So monitoring brain waves to detect fatigue patterns in workers. So again, with wearable type technologies like this, we're starting to build that into there as well. And we can start monitoring the fatigue levels, but also stress and other factors that might affect the performance of a worker over time. Um, being able to capture video. So just as simple as being able to get a video feed back to a person is great. We just sort of, sort of saw that working. Um, but also you can imagine now that we can also be capturing a constant video stream of what's happening on a site. And then with technologies like photogrammetry, we can start stitching that together and actually start getting a 3D model built from the photogrammetry and start understanding where things are. You know, where, where, what's today's progress versus yesterday's progress. We can start completing that kind of thing as well. Um, the remote expert scenario is what, exactly what you just saw. So that is the, the guy in another location being able to communicate, reduce travel time and, and efficiencies. Training and supervision, so really interesting. So there's some really uh, interesting things that can happen with the training side, being able to overlay what I should be doing on a, on, a, on a job, and particularly around maintain and repair and operate type things where we have some machinery, we need to train people how to operate the machinery. Um, we can overlay almost paint on top of them, if you like, the t uh, steps for completing a task. It could be an assembly task or a reassembly task or something like that. You can paint on top of it each step, one by one, sequentially take the person through the steps that they're supposed to be performing and show them exactly what they're supposed to be doing, reduce the error rates. Uh, so we can get them to do the task more effectively, more efficiently the first time. And we can also do this as an offsite training type activity where you can do effective training. Now we're actually, it's kind of a stepping stone, so we're seeing a lot of companies starting to do the training first offsite before applying it onto the real site. Um, and then the work instructions, which is, is, you know, is really exactly what I was saying, we can do those work instructions on the site and overlay that same thing. So while I'm working, I'm being shown exactly what to do, um, absolutely reduce the error rates. Where is this being used? So, this, um, this photograph is from Huntington and Ingalls, and Huntington and Ingalls is a big shipyard, uh, or big ship, um, defense contractor in the United States. Uh, their shipyard at Newport News builds nuclear uh, aircraft carriers. Now, a nuclear aircraft carrier, what is it? Well, it's a um, large structure. It houses 5,000 people, so it's got apartments for 5,000 people in it. It has an airport on top of it. It has a nuclear power station inside it and has some cinemas and some hospitals and some other things in there as well. So it's essentially a small city in its own right that just happens to float. And Huntington and Ingalls, during the construction process, they've actually been um, using augmented reality for a few years now, and it's, they started off with tablets. So literally just holding up an, an iPad and being able to see uh, information from the CAD models overlaid with what they're, what they're building. Um, the, what this has done for them has been quite transformative. So uh, in, one, in one, uh, one example where they're using this is on the deck plates. They have to weld 
the studs onto the deck plates. And what they're doing is they're using augmented reality to locate the position of all the studs that need to be welded in. Right, so hold, hold the iPad up, it shows the exact location where all the studs are supposed to be. Now what has this done? This has reduced the amount of time, the average time to correctly locate a stud before you weld it was 25 minutes of the welder's time. That's what they, on average they were taking to correctly locate the studs. They reduced this to three minutes, two people mind you, for three minutes, so that's six minutes of effort. 76% reduction in the amount of time taken for performing the task. Okay? So this is a massive improvement and it's improving accuracy as well. So it's faster, less effort, reduced, improving accuracy as well. Um, Boeing is using this as well uh, in assembly of, of aircraft and that by their measurements they're, they're uh, calculating a 94% reduction in the number of errors that are being made or the mistakes that are being made. So what does that mean? That means you can reduce the amount of rework. And think about all the impact of rework and what that means. Uh, that rework is really the enemy here because rework is the unpredictable stuff that, that causes all the delay and the disruption on a site. So again, if we can attack the, um, the, the, uh, the rework, this is how we build efficiency into, into the work sites. So um, now I'm just going to show you a short video. And, and this video is going to show you how you start putting a BIM model. So think about what we just saw at Huntington and Ingalls. We're now going to put that BIM model onto a real site. This happens to be a, a, a real hospital in the, in the US. So if we just run that video, hopefully. Our project today is at a, at a stage that's one of the most complex stages in the project. We've coordinated it, concrete's up, the structure's up. So we're at the point where now we're really just getting going, putting all of our MEP work in place. And of all projects, a hospital project is one of the most complex when it comes to putting MEP work in place. So by looking at the helmet today and seeing those scopes in the context of where they were going in, it was really interesting to see what was installed and what's going to be installed tomorrow, from electrical to plumbing to ductwork. What I saw was um, just, I was in awe. It was, it was pretty cool. It, it was uh, surprising how real it was in the same sense of being able to see in the future, right? So instead of just being in the virtual reality world and you're sort of stuck in, in far off land, right? You can actually see the walls, you can walk the job site, you can actually see what's in real life at that present time, look up, and you can see the future. This technology will change my job by making it another tool for us to communicate our efforts of modeling and coordination with other people, both installing and quality assurance and quality control aspect of the job. Well, the biggest problem that we run into is just the coordination effort. You know, everybody's trying to get as much components and their equipment into a small, limited space. So anytime that you can bring uh, tools such as the Daiquiri helmet to allow you to, to see that stuff would be would be a benefit. I think it's going to help out the MEP immensely, simply because the fact is they're going to be able to see a lot of the collisions that are above ceilings and situations that fall within the walls. So I think that's gonna help them immensely as far as getting ahead of the program, getting ahead, catch those issues early. It has the potential to answer a lot of the questions and issues that we have. Um, and a lot of that's around digitization, right? So we've digitized all of the information we consume in the field. We've digitized the capturing of information. What we haven't yet done is taken that digital information and put it right in front of the people in the field. So in, in using the helmet today, I think, I think that's where the real potential is. It allows you to see issues that might arise in context of where they're actually going to be installed. I think in the end, um, it'll help us you know, as a builder to, to head off a lot of those issues that potentially come out on projects. This is just the beginning. I think we're gonna see more and more of this stuff. I can see coordination meetings, instead of sitting behind a computer, being on a job site with helmets on. I see us using this technology to look in the future, both on the construction side and in the office when we're designing and modeling the components. Yeah, to physically be on, out there in the field and put two and two together, it helps out. It gets pretty exciting when you start to think about the IoT boom and having a lot of connected sensors, information on the job site that we don't have today. How is that going to connect into something so that you can see that when you're out in the job site? It's all great in the trailer. Um, we love having information in the trailer, but when you put it in, in the place of work, 
um, right on the job site, then it holds some true potential. So, just in conclusion, to, to, wrap, to wrap this up, a few key things that really sort of want to get out uh, messages across here. So, and this is the, the, um, the revolution of BIM leading off into how do we get this out into, onto a site and really put it in front of people while, they, while they're using it and while they're working. This is all predicated on being able, or the, the, the reasons for doing this is all around being able to improve the productivity of the worker. Um, the benefits we get are things like quality, so really importantly quality, which means less rework, which means less mistakes, which means less of all the disruption that we have to deal with. Um, safety for the end worker, which is of course important in, in every industry, but particularly in construction, really important. And then the ability to go and get the collaboration happening, right? How can we make, collaborate, make better decisions together, um, and drive that? And you know, as, as we're probably going to start seeing the, the very nature of construction contracts changing over, you know, over the, over the time, and collaboration becomes more and more important. Being able to use these kinds of tools in there as part of that collaboration becomes incredibly important. And just to wrap up, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is how do we take a person and improve their capabilities? So augmented reality, that word augmented, augmented is really, really powerful. This means being able to add, add to something, add to the capability of a human. So if we think about this in terms of how do we add to the capabilities of our workforce so they can do things better, they can do things more efficiently, um, and they can make better decisions, and they can utilise the information in the BIM models more effectively, then we can turn our people into effectively into our construction supermen. And I'll just leave you with that thought and one more short video. takes all the data from uh, the, the engines and from the fuel system and then paints all that data onto my visor here. So you're so looking at flying. an augmented reality display yeah. just like Iron Man. Yep. God, <laughs> so, so cool. But, uh, you know, da Daiquiri, the guys made the helmet, and, and then there's lots of AR options out okay. there, but, but yeah. this is just a pretty cool one, and they're working on, on you know, future iterations which get even more clever. And it's not a bad use case, because I can't really go looking at dials or looking around. Yeah, I, yeah, I, no, it's no, nice so. to have it here. So thank you very much. So that's, that's what we can do with augmented reality. We can turn people into supermen. Um, I'm not predicting that we're necessarily going to have flying jetpacks on building sites, but we certainly can take from that the hands-free nature and being able to get information to the person when they need it, when they're, when they're using it, and make the person more effective. So thank you very much. Thanks.